Okay, great. I think we'll just go ahead and get started now. Um, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Mitty Cheng. Um, I will be one of the co-moderators and co-hosts of this panel. Um, I'd like to just start off with a quick introduction of what we're doing here and then um, I'll introduce my co-host uh, who will introduce our panelists. Um, I know that many of you are probably looking at our intro slide right now. We will be swapping that over to our lovely faces um, shortly. Uh, so you'll be able to take a look at that. Um, but first, um, welcome to Stagnant to Sensational. This is a Rotary membership webinar series um, that is being hosted by Rotary Zone 24 West. Uh, we just want to let you guys know that we are aiming to keep this webinar at 45 minutes. Um, so if you'd like to ask any questions, um, there is the ability to ask Q&A here in Zoom. Um, just go ahead and click the Q&A button that's on Zoom and you can also um, raise your hand if you wanna ask a direct question or you can open up the chat dialog and send out questions to um, either myself directly as a private question or else you can just send it to everyone and we'll take a look at your questions. Um, and we are screening questions as well as we do have some questions from the audience from registration when you registered. So please do not feel offended if we don't get to your question. Um, we do have a limited amount of time. Um, now, everything that you will be seeing here is going to be recorded and is currently being recorded. Uh, so if for some reason you decide this is great uh, and you want to share it with someone, this will actually all be available later at greatideastoshare.com and we'll have that link URL for you later at the end of this webinar. And that is the official zone. 2432 membership blog. Um, so this will again be a YouTube video later that you can share with anyone you'd like. Uh, and so to get us started with our wonderful panel to explore some of our ideas about making Rotary Club sensational, I'd like to first uh, turn it over to my co-host who is Jackie Hobel from Zone 24 West and the Rotary Club of Athabasca, Alberta, Canada. Jackie is the Rotary Coordinator in Zone 24 West and is a wonderful Rotary Membership Champion. Um, I'd like to turn it over to her to introduce the rest of our panelists. Jackie, please take it away. Thank you, Mitty. Um, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, Mitty, of course, is no stranger to the Rotary stage. He's been a champion for engaging Rotary actors and millennials in Rotary. In growing Rotaract in zone 20, zones 25, 26, and around the world, uh, Mitty is president of the E Club of Silicon Valley and will be in Atlanta as chair of the Rotaract Pre Convention. Mitty, we've got a great group of panelists. What are we going to talk about this evening? Well, I'm very excited uh, because we're going to be talking about quite a few different things. Um, first, uh, our three, we're talking about membership overall uh, and how you can become sensational. And then the first three things that we're going to be talking about is attraction. Um, we're really going to be talking about how we can attract new energy and ideas into our club and, you know, create more impact. Um, we're going to be focusing a lot of this conversation about attracting younger leaders, baby boomers, um, diverse ethnic groups, as well as more females into Rotary. Um, then we're going to be also talking about retention with some questions that are geared about um, how can we reverse that downward membership trend that we've been seeing in North America um, where a lot of our members are leaving. Um, and then finally, we'll be talking about club culture, um, making our clubs vibrant and welcoming and fun um, and more happening places. So um, you'll see a lot of those questions will be geared about um, how can we overcome some of the uh, existing orthodoxies and barriers that are in Rotary Clubs. Um, Jackie, I'd like to turn it back to you to introduce our wonderful panelists. So, Thank you. I'm um, excited to have the opportunity um, to share some ideas about membership in Rotary and welcome our international guest panelists. I'd like you now to meet Evan Burrell, a Rotary superhero from Sydney, Australia. Evan is a member of the Rotary Club of Turamura in New South Wales. And Evan, you can correct the pronunciation of that if I got that wrong. Um, Evan's uh, passion for Rotary comes out uh, in, in 
many ways. He believes that Rotarians have amazing superpowers. Um, Evan, welcome. Thank you. Would you like to comment on what you think are the super superpowers of Rotarians? Um, sure. Well, um, and, and at first it's, it's pronounced Taramara. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so the the uh, superpowers of Rotarians. Well, that's a, a, a sort of a campaign I've been running with now for, uh, I suppose, two years or so, is that Rotarians are uh, superheroes. We just don't wear the capes. And so if you think about that, uh, sort of a superhero, you know, all the stuff in the movies, Captain America, Superman, all that sort of thing. Um, Rotarians do a lot of superhero acts that we, we don't seem to... Um, uh, well, we take for granted a little bit and we, and we don't seem to acknowledge it. You know, we might not rescue cats from trees, but we do, you know, we're, we're, we're um, immunising children against polio. We're, you know, doing disaster relief in places like Haiti through shelter box and disaster aid. Uh, we, you know, we do local community thing, putting in a, in a park, um, you know, uh, playground equipment and parks and things like that so there's so many different uh, acts that we do uh, and um, as rotarians that really we are sort of rotary heroes and if we all sort of you know um uh, had that sort of superhero mindset i think you know we can really appeal uh, to a new demographic of people who want to join us on our sort of superhero journey thanks evan um I, and also uh I'd just like to mention that I was able to find a great video about Rotary on your Facebook page. Um, I just encourage uh, our listeners to uh, check out Evan Burrell's Facebook page. He's got lots of great uh, videos hidden away there. Thanks, and, thanks for that. Okay, we're thrilled as well to welcome Danielle Lalamont, nursing administrator. Danielle started her career, her Rotary career, in Reno, Nevada. In 2013, she relocated to the San Francisco Bay Area and was founding member and charter president of the uh, San Francisco Evening Rotary Club. In the past few years, she has attended the Young Professional Summit in Chicago, organized by West Coast Young Professional Summit in Berkeley, uh, California. Danielle, welcome. Tell us more about yourself and your focus in Rotary. Well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, I actually am thinking right now, I'm thinking about what superhero I would be <laughs> if I had to choose. I feel like I need a cape, Evan. You're kind of, you know, you're giving us a lot of thought here. <laughs> um, so yes, I, I did start my career, uh, my Rotary career, I guess you could say, when I lived in Nevada. and. Uh, I was involved in a fantastic club. It was a more of a typical traditional type club, you know, lunch club, about 120 members and fantastic. One of the best introductions in the organization that I had had. Um, but when I came to San Francisco, it was really hard to find a club that fit my schedule and worked for me. And so we, there were a group of us um, that chartered or founded and chartered the San Francisco Evening Club, which it typically is a young professional club not it wasn't meant to be that way initially it's just that was the demographic that we attracted uh, so we had about 75 percent of our members were brand new to rotary we had two members over the age of 50 maybe but it's a young club um, and what i found in this whole process was there were a lot of other people like me that had not really known about rotary didn't know what rotary was thought that it was only for men uh, certainly didn't think, you know, a young woman could be involved. And I saw that with my club members as they would get in. So I started getting more involved in the, um, they started this campaign with the Young Professional Campaign. And so Mitty, he was also attendee. We went to the Chicago Summit and it just, it sparked something in me of really wanting to give back on what I had learned in my club, what I was seeing and what we were seeing um, globally. And so from that, we had the Young Professional Summit here in uh, Berkeley. And uh, I was fortunate enough to serve on the, um, on the membership committee as a Young Professional Advisor. Uh, there are three of us actually from, one was from the Philippines and another member from Germany. And it was such a wonderful experience. Um, 
but it also made me aware that uh, there's a lot of work to be done and there are a lot of areas of membership that we could certainly focus on um, and work with. And uh, now I'm starting a new club in a different area of San Francisco. It's a different, uh, actually, the demographic is completely different. So it's given me a different perspective. They're more recently retired. So I'm the attraction for members there is a little bit different than what I did with my club, um, which has been really good. And it gives me a better you know, thought of what we could do with membership. And then besides that, I, and I'm going to give a little shame, shameless plug <laughs> for our, uh, the Rotary Connecting for Good Tour, uh, which we are hosting in Zones 2526, which I am the chair of, and it's starting on Saturday. So all of these things that I've been involved in is more so of a direct reflection of my club, what they're looking for, how we can attract more people, um, you know, a little bit of innovation, relevance, that sort of thing. Um, so that's a little bit about me. That's why I'm so driven into the young professional community. Thank you, Danielle. Um, as Mitty mentioned, we're going to talk about attraction. We're going to talk about retention and uh, club culture and helping clubs become more vibrant. Would you like to comment on those three areas and, and maybe give some specifics? Sure. <laughs> I was like, is this for me or for Evan? <laughs> um, so as far as, uh, you know, culture, for sure, um, when it comes to club culture, and I'm sure Evan has um, some great thoughts on this as well, I think a lot of people don't, uh, they may not look at their club after an amount of time. They may be in the club for a long time, and it's the same club, and they do the same things but have they looked at a recent assessment of their club members? You know, do they have club members that are leaving? Do they have club members that can't attend anymore because they have different, you know, points of life and they have to, they have different time commitments, that sort of thing. I think that clubs, cultures can change, uh, certainly depending on community areas and if they change. Um, as a matter of fact, there's an example of a club that they had been losing membership and in their community, they found all around them the community had changed, the culture of the community had changed. And they were trying to figure out how do we bring in these people that are a different culture. And so they purposely completely changed their culture and started uh, recruiting from, well, attracting those members of the community and their whole club culture changed. Um, but it was a really great example for how you can affect that with your club. Thanks, Danielle. Evan, do you want to comment? Sure. Um, and certainly backing up what Danielle says in regards to, to club culture, it's very important. And, and I think even the, the title of this um, seminar, From Stagnant to Sensational, and sometimes things look with stagnant water, you sort of need to give it a mix it around, you know, and, and, and sort of break it up a bit and get rid of this mosquito, so to speak. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and but one of the things I think in regards to um, young membership or well young membership is, is is a goal but it's something that we shouldn't always be focused on and sometimes I'll find that some clubs will be you know members will be in their 60s or 70s something like that and they'll have you know they'll get in one young member who's in their say 20s or 30s and you know it'd be like you know they've just brought in the messiah or something like that but sometimes they we you know clubs sort of focus too much on on attracting these sorts of really young demographic where I think they should probably more focus on, you know, people in maybe their forties or fifties or something like that. Uh, you know, start, um, you know, start a little bit younger than them, but not, not too young. And then if they get in recruit a lot of forties and 50 year olds, and then, you know, then it's more likely you'll get, you know, thirties and 20 year olds, you know, it's, it's, you sort of work down from there. But my thing too is about, Sometimes some club members uh, and certainly the leadership of some clubs, they don't seem to, you know, put themselves in another people's shoes. You know, they, they, they sometimes they can't um, step back and have a look at their club and what their club is doing and how, you know, it is attractive. And I always, and I always say, um, you know, would you join your club today? You know, if they've been there for 20 or 30 years. So what can you do differently that makes it, um, can make it more attractive? And if that sort of... Um, you know, fiddling around with the edges, so to speak, will, will, will so be it. But 
I think there was a quote too that always gets put around from Paul Harris is, you know, we've always got to be, you know, at times revolutionary and, and changing and all that sort of thing. And I think sometimes we really do need to um, pay heed to that and, you know, actually listen to some of that advice. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. And uh, I heard you mention uh, uh, the boomer demographic. And I know Rotary International President John Germ feels very passionate about this particular uh, group, as well as young professionals. And uh, certainly we want to uh, remove barriers uh, uh, for both those groups uh, uh, so that they do become members of our Rotary Club. One question, uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to Mitty. Um, and this would be to both of you. Uh, what would you say to a younger member prospect about the benefits of joining Rotary? Uh, so, actually, um, I think that's a really great question because I think that uh, younger members particularly have a competition of time. And so sometimes you have to offer them value for what they're getting involved in. Um, it's a question I've had to answer a lot from members that have joined my club. And uh, why should they join this organization when they can volunteer for free if that's what they would like to do or those sorts of things. You know, they have to pay a membership fee and, and all of that. Um, what we actually promote and something I've seen in some of the other clubs that I have gone to in districts is they offer a lot of professional development, which is really attractive for people. Um, and that is something that I try to, you know, expand upon depending on who the audience is. You know, I think it also depends on if you're speaking to somebody who is more in, engaged in their family or in that sort of time in their life, then maybe, you know, you talk more about the fellowship and family aspect of it. I think Ultimately, it's really about your audience of who you are, are discussing and talking to. Um, I think there are a lot of points in Rotary that we could certainly advertise. It's more of what is it the member really wants and what do they need? Um, I don't know, Evan, what do you, what do you think? Um, again, you know, thank you very much. You sort of covered everything. Up. <laughs> but, but what I wanted to say too was that, um, there's not many organizations that we actually have to pay to, to volunteer for and rotary being one of them. So of course, you know, what is a young person? Well, not even a young person. What does any person get out of rotary, you know, for us to outlay the, the cost and um, time and all that sort of stuff. And I always push. And certainly when I was going through Rotary Act, which was something that was totally missing in some respects from rotary was a real friendship group, a real bond. And I think if, if that was more developed in clubs to have a more of a, a, a more than just an acquaintance a more of a friendship group, then you'll find that people might commit a lot more than what they normally would um, to rotary. But also too, is that, um, you can't, ex you know, young members can't expect just because they're young or, or whatever to have things just laid out for them, to have all these opportunities just given to them through Rotary. You know, you have to, in a sense, you've got to play the game, so to speak. You know, you have to um, seek these opportunities out there. And they are out there with through Rotary. I've been very fortunate, the group study exchange and all sorts of different things. But um, they weren't just just given to me you have to you really have to look for it but also to um, the members of the club can also you know if you've got a club of you know 20 30 40 50 60 100 or so members each one of those members has some life skills which you know they can impart to a new member which um, you know you wouldn't otherwise get through your normal you know business or work or life or things like that so I think mentorship and uh, and then certainly uh, work mentoring is not um, heavily pushed by club members either, which I think is, is valuable, um, which is something that you know, a young person can really, you know, take some um, some solace out of trying to get some some great information from uh, from one of their fellow members. Thank thank you, Evan. Um, Mitty, I'll I'll turn it over to you. Oh, terrific! Thank you, Jackie. Uh, so. And, and so I think some of you guys, I'm going to share my screen really quick. So some of you guys have seen this number before, um, and I know our panelists have a, as well. And Rotary membership worldwide has stayed pretty stagnant at about 1.2 million members for over a decade. Um, recently, we've seen some increases in the past year, 
Um, but in, in North America in general, we've seen a, a massive membership decline. And what we've seen is that Rotary members, the average age of a Rotary member, a Rotarian, is actually increasing, um, where the average age is 55 and older in North America. Um, and where when you're breaking down um, based off of what's reported to Rotary International through Rotary.org, the worldwide age um, of Rotary members is there's actually less than 4% of Rotary members that are under the age of 40. Um, and so the concern being that over half of the world's population is under the age of 35 right now, um, and the Rotary membership definitely not reflecting that. Um, my question, this one's directed to you, Evan, um, is uh, specifically about what, what things do you think um, happen at a Rotary club right now, orthodoxies, for example, um, that kind of prevent uh, younger members from wanting to join the club, you know, what, what do you think would deter uh, members where, you know, the first step of uh, solving any problem, of course, is admitting that you have that problem. And this is that, that phase for us right now, um, where we're just trying to understand what are some of the things that you think um, just should be changed in a Rotary Club culture? And you're muted if you want yeah, to. Yep, yeah, I'll unmute myself. Um, so <laughs> maybe the smell of mothballs, perhaps. Um, okay. Yeah, I think that you know clubs kind of get very clicky, and they're sort of orthodoxy, and they can and they develop their own sort of insular culture where um, you know as much as we all talk about new members when, when a new member comes in it can be very difficult for them to understand what their rotary is what their role in is the club and also to sub club members you know can be so used to their own way of doing things and saying you know this is where i sit and you know i don't no one else sits in this particular spot and i always get the meal first and i always do this first that for a new member it can be very off-putting and i think clubs uh, members should be a little bit more open to um you know being a little bit more inclusive perhaps and and some of the other barriers too. some of the the real traditional elements uh, of the way clubs things do things like I'm not a fan of singing in a rotary club I really am not and um, it's a big thing in the United States I've been to a few clubs where they sing and all this sort of stuff and uh, guys you know you're not going on American Idol or or X Factor it's not happening um, <laughs> So, you know, and that kind of stuff. And, and also, too, like particularly in Australia, we sing the anthem and do all these sorts of things. And, and it's something that um, just doesn't feel, you know, there's nowhere else in your career or whatever else that this sort of thing happens. And so it's, you know, I suppose some people like it. It's a bit of a, bit of a novelty. But, you know, does it add, what does it add to, um, you know, what does it add to your, your sort of journey through Rotary? And the other thing too is that um, sometimes just having a meeting for the sake of having a meeting and a guest speaker, I think a lot of younger people want to see some sort of results and some action. So when they give up their time to come to a meeting or do something, they want to see something tangible. Okay, I've given up my hour or two hours to come. Uh, what are we, you know, what's happening from here? Or if we've just had, had a nice, you know, well, nice is just a funny word, a terrible rotary chicken. And then uh, we've had a meeting and a speaker about something that I couldn't even, you know, he just spoke and I couldn't even tell you what he was speaking about. So, you know, we perhaps we need to think about what's something tangible that uh, our members can actually achieve and, and what, what can they you know, give back, so to speak. Hopefully that answered it. That's great. Thanks, Evan. Um, Daniel, this question is for you, and it's kind of a follow-up to some of the things Evan talked about. Uh, but what are some specific strategies or techniques either that you've seen or that in your experience you've employed um, are ways that club presidents can go out there to attract new members, whether or not that's a young professional or a baby boomer? Um, if you could speak a little bit about that. Sure, thank you. I'm actually trying to get over my laughter from Ed's answer on the last question. I just, this is great. <laughs> I feel like I want to record you, Evan. This is fantastic. <laughs> um, so yeah, actually, uh, one thing that we have found is social media is extremely important, especially in today's world, for sure. 
people are communicating in a whole different realm at this point. Technology is pretty much key in a lot of areas. So I think that in some ways you're going to attract certain people just in general if you are more involved in social media and uh, put things up on you know, Facebook or Instagram or you could use Meetup as another platform. Um, that was one thing that we found uh, when we were first inviting people and attracting people is by uh, using social media. But, but uh, with my whole experience now with this other club and uh, being from a club prior to this that wasn't necessarily really big into social media, it also depends on the community culture of where you are. So in San Francisco, it's very tech. If you're not on social media here, you might as well be obsolete in some ways because it's everywhere. Um, now, if I was in a small town, maybe in middle America or in some other areas of the world um, where social media isn't the way that people communicate and how they communicate is by posting, um, you know, poster boards and meeting people face to face, then that would be what you should focus on. And I think, you know, really doing a community assessment, um, a club assessment in the area is one of the best tools that you can do to figure out what is the best way to communicate with people in this area. Um, the club that I am working on currently, they really are focused on local community service and they like to talk to each other. I mean, they're literally in the neighborhood, walking down the street, inviting people to the meeting. Now, not that they don't use Facebook, but they just, that isn't their source of communication. So I think it's really reading your community. I, I think that that in general is one of the best ways that you can attract people. Well, that's great. Thanks, Danielle. Um, this question is for you, Evan, um, specifically about road reactors making the transition from road rack to rotary. What do you think are some of the biggest reasons or barriers for um, road reactors not making that transition? And specifically, what are some strategies do you think that club presidents can actually employ to make their clubs more attractive to road reactors or bridge that divide? Uh, that's a great question. Um, well, I'm not going to say the usual line that that everyone sort of, you know, brings out and they say money. I, I can't, road rackers won't join rotary because it's too expensive. And the thing I always say is, well, if you can, um, if you can get your, an iPhone, a new iPhone every year, you know, um, and all the rest of it, and you can buy all this sort of stuff and, and all that sort of thing. So um, you can afford to come to rotary. It's all about what your priorities are. And so what I say in regards to why retention from rotary to rotary isn't so great and it's a two it's a two part we're both both at fault for this one is that rotor rotarians um don't actively uh you know suppose the word is ingratiate themselves into a rotary club and develop a, a strong relationship a strong bond a friendship so that you know like myself you know you're just moving from rotary to rotary just felt natural just something that you know to keep keep moving sort of forward and then on the op flip side is that uh, rotor actors um you know need to be able to offer their skills and their you know enthusiasm and energy into a club and and you know even though it's sometimes it might be a little painful to come to a rotary meeting or whatever just sort of grin and bear it and see that you know the, the, the goal see that you know there's something a little bit further out there in the horizon um, and see what the benefits and opportunities are for rotor actors to be involved in, in rotary and I think the thing is, is it, you know the age limit of rotor act you're only a you know 30 year old or sort of thing and whether we sort of take much advantage of it you know now or not you know is sort of I don't really like the age agent we should never have put it on there but this whole thing and now where you can sort of be a rotor actor and a rotarian at the same time is good, which means you can sort of keep two feet in both camps. But also I say that um, there are certainly some rotor act clubs out there where people are you know, losing enthusiasm and energy because they might be, you know, getting to the upper age limit or the club sort of aging out. Um, I always say is, well, look, turn yourselves into a rotary club. You know, there's no, there's no inherent, um, gap or anything or, or, or sort of not gap wall you know you, you can sort of keep doing what you guys want to keep doing and you're a brand new club and that sort of new club element might have some more promotional motivation to be able to sell hey we're a new club we're a new charter a new rotary club with young professionals you don't need to tell anybody you were just at rotary club last week so um, I think there are certainly plenty of opportunities out there but it, it takes two to tango uh, to use a mixed metaphor it takes two to tango so that Rotarians need to really lift their game up 
um, and involving themselves um, involved in rotor actors and not in an authoritative sort of way. And then rotor actors need to involve themselves in rotary programs, but not understand that, um, you know, that they're sort of, you know, need also to contribute to. So hopefully that kind of answers. Uh, oh, I, I just want to step back to, I mean, if you don't mind about Danielle's question about Facebook and social media and all that sort of stuff. And I think, uh, social media is incredibly important for for clubs to have. There's no sort of question about it now, and much more than sort of a website. And I think the thing about social media is, and it's this is what a lot of young millennials and people will look at, is that the first thing they'll do if they're going to interested in your club is they'll look at what presence you have on social media. And if you haven't updated anything on your Facebook page in two years, well, they're going to think, well, obviously your club's not doing anything. So it's it, I always say this, and the success I get with social media is about telling a story. And get people to buy into that. So if you can, if you can, um, you know, if your club has got a good story to tell, it's it's going to be a good way of attracting people through that. But you've got to be consistent. You've got to have your real voice, and you've got to have a good story to tell. So that was just answering that question before. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Evan. Um, we're actually going to go to an audience question right now. Um, this question is from Ian Ferdinson from District Seventy Eight Ten in Canada. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually rephrase Ian's question um, slightly because he asked two. Um, this question is directed to Danielle, um, and his question was specifically: uh, Do you believe that long-term Rotarians or Rotarians who are currently in Rotary um, share the same priorities as millennials or young professionals that either may want to join Rotary or are even part of Rotary? Sure. Um, thank you, Ian, uh, for the question. I actually am going to uh, talk just a little bit about the summit that we held last year. Um, so the Young Professional Summit we did in Berkeley, we actually invited uh, young professionals and also district leaders. So there was 60 young professionals all up and down the West Coast and 60 district leaders. So these were district governors, district governor-elects, um, district governor nominees. And so a lot of them had been established Rotarians for, um, and had been involved in the organization for a long time. And the reason we did this, it was, it was kind of a test. Um, we wanted to see if all of the same things that the young professionals, the millennials, you know, whatever you want to call um, younger generations, we wanted to see if what their interest was in Rotary, if it was similar to the leadership and to people that had been in the organization for a long time. So we put them in separate groups initially. They both worked on the summit the first day. They were getting excited doing these things. But we asked them um, to come up with five different orthodoxies. And basically, these were values of the organization, things that were, um, could be an issue in the organization where they thought that we had opportunity to make change. And so separately, they did this. So Friday night, we had an artist that actually put together the orthodoxies and made them into this beautiful piece of art. And we had an event Friday night. We brought everybody back together. And they displayed all of those orthodoxies from both groups. And it was interesting because it was exactly what we were hoping. The orthodoxies were the same. So there wasn't, you couldn't tell which group had said, you know, dues could be too expensive for people or, you know, certain things were very similar in both groups. And so what that told us was that as much as people think it's about age, it's not about age. Um, it's not about demographics. It's, it, it's really about your values and your thoughts in the organization. So the next day on Saturday when everybody was together and they saw that they were mirror images of each other and it was electric. I mean, people were so excited to work and that's kind of what prompted this whole tour that we're doing because we realized all of a sudden it wasn't about, we didn't want to be young professionals. We're Rotarians. All of us are Rotarians. We're all trying to better the world, and we all wanted to work together. So it was really, it was really eye-opening, actually. So that's just my experience. <laughs> I love that response. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Daniel. Yeah, I just want to jump in, and I think that um, uh, the the research. Uh, initiated by Rotary International, Siegel and Gale, indicated that uh, Rotarians join Rotary for the fellowship and for to have a community impact. 
And I would suggest that probably those would be the top two with, uh, with, the, with younger uh, young leaders. Um, in our part of the world, we're starting to talk about, um, uh, we dropped the word professionals and we're talking about uh, uh, attracting young, uh, young rotary leaders who have a heart for service. And it's really that heart for service. And uh, certainly Rotary International has changed the definition of what a Rotarian is and taken out uh, a lot of words that suggested you had to be a business owner or, or a, a, you know, a, a professional in order to join Rotary. And uh, so I think that the, that's opened, opened the doors. The other comment I'd like to make is, I really think that uh, Rotary Clubs are starting to reinvent themselves. And um, uh, there's, uh, there's no cookie cutter, uh, no cookie cutter model for uh, what a Rotary Club would, uh, would, look like, would look like that had lots of young professionals. That's terrific. It's um, funny you say cookie cookie cutter, Jackie. Uh, um, on my Facebook page, there was a, a company in Argentina have just made a, a little uh, cookie cutter rotary wheel, so you can now make rotary cookies if you want to. Uh, so well, check it out. Well, you better send it to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> uh, touching on your point too um, about clubs reinventing themselves, and I think also too is that uh, public image of Rotary is incredibly important and I think it should be one of the high, besides obviously delivering service, it should, should be also one of the high priorities because, um, you know, you speak about the, um, I, I think keep saying Siskel and Ebert, whatever the, whoever the, did the, 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 um, the branding, it wasn't Siskel and Ebert, I know that for sure, they did the review. Um, but in Sydney, Mitty and I, um, a few weeks ago, we did a little, tour around Sydney Harbour and we asked people, you know, if they knew what sort of the rotary wheel was. And it was, was surprised how many people didn't really know. And the people that did, they sort of had those sorts of um, preconceived ideas that were, you know, men only and, you know, uh, just had meetings and that sort of thing. So for, for clubs to attract new people, we've actually got to get out there and tell people what we actually do. You know, we are, you know, like the rotary superhero, we are, um, you know, ending polio we are doing this we are helping in the local community and the only way to sort of get members to join your club is to actually talk to them and to talk about what you do and, and I think that's incredibly important for um, not only um, membership recruitment but also retention and that's actually speaking to your members who you've got in your club and tell your members about what other opportunities are available or what the club is up to and you know this sort of transparency and it's not as if Rotary International isn't making it easier for us because the organisation is, you know, they've just had the council legislation. So there's these huge changes. So it's not, you know, people say, oh, it's Rotary, this Rotary, it's RI's fault. It's not their fault. It's clubs. Clubs have to sort of, you know, get off their bums or their backside, so to speak, and actually go out and sort of start making these, these changes happen and start making these, um, you know, these things work because as many said earlier in the webinar, you know, we've been 1.2 million members now for best part of a decade. Why is that? You know, how come we can't be 1.5, 1.6? How come we can't be 2 million members? And I think there's just something that some spark that just has to, to go off, in, in, you know, in someone's mind to be able to get people to flood through the, through, you know, through the floodgates, so to speak, of, of joining Rotary, of joining our clubs. I just got to figure out what it is. Terrific. I just want to make one comment to what um, Evan actually just said, and it kind of corresponds as well with social media um, about public image. And, you know, people, I think, don't realize that when, say, they go to your face, you go to a Facebook page or to a website, and all you see is like the picture of mountains or, you know, it's some sort of something that may not be um, as engaging. They don't understand what that is. So they, you know, they come to your Facebook page or they come to your website, they see that and their first initial instinct is, okay, what is this for? And instead, if you have a Facebook page where you have people with pictures and, you know, of your events and your fun and happy people and doing service, I think it gives a, a better 
um, idea of what Rotary can do and the fellowship and the, you know, the different um, community service aspects. I think we are really bad at uh, telling our story about the great work that we do. I think at the RI level, just like Evan said, we do a great job. And I think that we certainly are advertising. But when it comes to clubs, clubs do amazing things and they just don't tell people. It's just, and then, you know, when I, when I talk to clubs and I hear some of their projects, I think, why don't you have a hundred members in here? Because they do so much great work. And I just, I think that's a really good place for an opportunity. So. Oh, I, I totally agree with you, Danielle. I think sometimes we need to start with the service first. And let's bring them out to a service project and let's give them a menu of different kinds of projects that they can be involved in. And then we gradually start talking about Rotary membership. Once they've made connections uh, with, with the folks that are working on the project. Um, I see Carol has uh, made a comment about um, the new uh, Council on Legislation uh, um, changes. Uh, and a comment that this should help with membership growth, and I totally concur. I think that uh, we've been very rigid for uh, many, many years, and and now we have an opportunity to look at our bylaws and uh, structure clubs uh, in a way that suits us. Um, uh, uh, and. Uh, you know, I think we're going to see more satellite clubs and uh, different styles of memberships and uh, so forth. So I see Mitty's giving us the, the hook here. And uh, Mitty, I'll let you uh, wind sure. this down. I, I love the conversation that we're having. Uh, we did say that this would be a 45 minute webinar. So we are just about to be running out of time. Um, do you want to make a quick comment to um, the conversation and then I will be asking both uh, Evan and Danielle for some of their, their parting words of wisdom before I turn over to Jackie to wrap up the webinar. Uh, and I think one of the biggest comments would be um, uh, social media in having a strong digital presence is great, um, especially if you want to attract newer members or um, talk to younger generations. It's not necessarily to um, attract your club to you know, someone who's in your club already or even directly their friends. But it's um, the big part of social media has always been who's going to make that post, um, who's going to do that. Um, and, and I think a lot of times Rotary clubs don't um, pursue it because they don't have anyone who is a social media guru. Um, and, and I think part of that is seeking out creative solution to that. Um, there are a lot of uh, youth programs that Rotary partners with, interactors, Rotary actors, youth exchange students, um, and there are, even if you don't have an interact club or interact club in your area, there are other um, young professionals and young leaders and students in your area. Partner up with one of them or offer an internship with them. Have them be your social media intern for six months. Uh, and in exchange, you know, maybe send them to the Rotary International Convention as a travel scholarship um, or work something else out with them. Um, there's always a resource out there if you're willing to be created. Um, I, I, Sorry, Danielle, I'm going to turn it to you and then I'm going to turn it to Evan. Um, Danielle, some parting words of wisdom and advice that you have for club presidents who are pursuing membership growth. Great, thank you. Um, well, first, uh, thank you all for listening to us. Hopefully this was somewhat helpful or entertaining, <laughs> at least. Um, and I would say my parting thoughts uh, would be, I, I think it's very helpful when we listen to our members and to not be afraid of ideas, um, new ways of doing things. You know, if, if somebody comes to you in the club and says, hey, I have this idea for a new project or a new community organization, I think it would be good to work with, um, be open to that because ultimately that will naturally drive your club into a, you know, a more relevant state because people will be happy, they're doing different things, people's voices will be heard. Uh, I think ultimately we have to listen to our members because they, they are uh, what creates your clubs. And, uh, and when you do have new people that do come in, I think it's also helpful to invite their ideas and opinions on ways to innovate as well. So that would be my parting thoughts. Thank you, Danielle. And Evan? Your party thoughts. Sure. Um, so, yeah, my, my sort of last thoughts would be um, clubs need to be innovative and, we, you know, we need to 
the organization is 110, nearly 100, sorry, 111, 111, 112, whatever it is. We're over 100 years old. Um, and so we, we can't just rely on what we've done previously. We have to constantly keep the rotary wheel moving. It is a gear wheel, so we've got to keep it, keep it moving. And that means, you know, develop our story tell it a little bit better, use the resources that we have, social media, these sorts of things, and make the story more about us as the members. You know, in your club, there must be, you know, hundreds of different people, thousands of people all around the world who have their own unique sort of rotary stories to tell, which can be used to attract people to, to you know, who've got similar situations to come along to your clubs. So my thing is that develop what your story is and learn how to tell it properly, but also be innovative enough that sometimes your club may need to do things a little differently and what you've done previously may not work anymore. So be prepared to accept that and, and kind of, you know, think less about selfishly about yourself and more about rotary in general and say, well, sometimes we just have to grin and bear at this change, but we know it's for the benefit of, of the future of the organization of, and of our club. So yeah, my thing is though is um yeah be innovative, stay positive, um and yeah just keep that wheel turning, keep on trucking. Thank you so much, Evan. Jack, I'm gonna turn it to you to close out our webinar and um, talk about what's next. Thank you, thank you, Mitty. And I think that um, the whole uh, purpose in in looking at membership is that we have more impact as an organization. And uh, I see that Carol made a, a comment about Club Runner uh, uh, that, you know, clubs need to be a little bit more um, savvy with some of our technology. And um, uh, we're, uh, I really believe that we're at a, at a time when we're becoming a little bit more flexible. I know Rotary International is really trying to uh, improve the, the tools that uh, are available to us. So um, I'm really getting some uh, sign language from Australia about Club Runner. Anyway, um, just want to remind everybody on the call that we have some tremendous tools and some ideas that we can share uh, on our Zone 2432 blog site, great ideas to share. Uh, uh, please visit it frequently. We, we put club strategies in. This is what the site where we will post the uh, recorded uh, webinars. And um, next slide, Mitty, please. And our, speaking of mem uh, webinars, our next uh, webinar is going to be on growing membership again and non-traditional membership opportunities and that's scheduled for uh, Thursday, November the 17th and there will be lots of communication uh, about about that webinar. Following that we will have um, uh, webinars on uh, club vital signs and posting your goals on Rotary Club Central and some more on attracting young Rotary leaders and uh, and club culture. Um, so I would just like to uh, say thank you to our panelists. Uh, uh, there certainly wasn't enough time. We're always pushed for time when we get into these topics. Uh, but I really appreciate that we've had a really international panel today. And it's certainly a, a topic that we are all concerned about. So thank you. Thank right. you, Maggie. It was fun. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity um, for all the way from Sydney, Australia. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And uh, we will see you at the web next webinar. Bye, everyone. Bye. Mitty, are we going to stay on the line?